Uh, my name is uh, Greg Deal. I am a husband and a father, um, an artist, a disruptor, I guess. And um, I grew up in Utah, uh, Park City, Utah. Um, lived in D.C. for 17 years where I kind of made my bones at the beginning of my career and uh, now live in Colorado. And um, yeah, I, I'm an artist. I make things. I work, I mean, I, I consider myself to be a contemporary artist that um, you is speaking from an indigenous perspective, um, or at least from my perspective, my experience. Um, that oftentimes comes with uh, challenging subject matters and power structures that um, inform the Western world on indigenous existence. And so um, some of the work kind of pushes against a lot of that um, in the process. But um, I'm, I'm influenced by things that interest me when I grew up. Um, there's a pop element, but I mean, you know, I'm of the generation where pop culture became a staple. And so I think that that um, plays a part in the work um, while still simultaneously trying to find uh, and push for, um, I don't want to say high art, but, you know, um, push for, for new things that are exciting and that intersect contemporaryism with uh, indigenous identity, whether that's basket patterns or social or political issues or um, representation or, you know, anything along those lines. So uh, the series that I've been working on for the last several years is called The Others. Uh, I have reappropriated old comic book images from the 40s and 50s and um, changed the, the, the sort of, I guess, the trope that exists in representing natives in, like, the cowboy and Indian scenario, um, which is to say that, that I recreate them so that the natives are either standing very strong, making a strong statement, or are winning a fight or a battle that's happening. Um, so often, you know, natives are like the D-listers in their own story on their own homelands. And so um, this flips out a little bit. Um, the comics are actually uh, appropriated from an old series uh, by Frank Franzetta, um, who was originally um, made famous for doing Conan the Barbarian, um, but his longest running series was a series called White Indian, and it's exactly what you think it is. It is a white dude, and, and, which is a strange trope in like Hollywood and, and things of like, the, the white dude is more native than the native, you know, like, and I'm thinking of like more contemporary versions, you know, or it's just like uh, Dances with Wolves and um, Last of the Mohicans. I mean, the two main characters are white guys that are like more native than any native that was ever native. And, um, and so uh, that's what the white Indian was essentially was like in terms of like how it presented itself. Um, but the generalization of that illustration style back then um, makes everybody kind of look the same. So what changes is like skin color and hair color and that's it. And so I was able to sort of switch some things around uh, so that the uh, protagonist is a brown skinned native. It, it, if you look at punk and you look at, you know, like the indigenous struggle, this is some low hanging fruit, you know, like <laughs> it's like the, the disenfranchisement that's felt within this music genre and the people that are associated with it. Um, doesn't equate to indigenous struggle, but there's a lot of the same language. And so it's relatable. So as a young native kid growing up, like these things make sense to me. And so bringing that back to here where these things are like interacting in this space and it's, you know, it's about uh, equality and representation and it's about, um, you know, the uh, disenfranchisement from power structures that are, you know, that are creating those inequities and uh, equality and gentrification, which is not like Indian removal, but a, some of the language is the same. And so it, it all begins to sort of make sense within the realm of that. And I don't think any of these guys meant to create something that like I would be using in this way. Um, but I think that that music speaks to the intersectionality of like 
representation, you know, not just for me, but like, you know, people of color in general, that there is a shared experience and a shared set of language that helps create something that, where you feel like you belong. And I think that's part of that. Tutsi Nakaiwu, uh, which is, um, it means minor threat in Paiute. Um, and it's loosely translated, but, uh, but it, it, it makes sense is, um, I mean, it's a nod towards, I suppose, the punk thing, but I think it also speaks to this idea of creating work that is challenging Western perception of indigenous existence, um, which ultimately is a, a threat to the expectations as it relates to um, the buildup of Western culture, which of course is connected to settler colonialism, capitalism, uh, uh, with a dash of, you know, white supremacy. So it, it's like a minor threat to those systems that are, are challenging the perception of the existence of the original inhabitants of the space we call the United States. Most of the work that I've been doing, you can see it in the others. There's a background and the background is in and of itself abstract. And so I'm using um, melting and dripping and basket patterns. And so, so there is a sense of, um, I think, um, maybe a dash of abstract expressionism sort of in the background that, that makes up the negative space. Um, so instead of painting a whole scene with backgrounds and trees or buildings or whatever, um, that I am using the sort of the, the nature of geometrical shapes that exist in the patterns that are on the traditional baskets of my people, um, along with these reliefs of breaking up paint and uh, using spray paint or using acrylic and you know acetone. And so I'm using all these things to create a space that the figures can be in. But I've never really uh, gone after abstract work as like a, a viable sort of subject within the mediums that I'm working with. And so um, I've taken care to separate the figurative work from the backgrounds and then push on the backgrounds as its own work to see what it looks like, how it might work, how it might interact, um, and make some deliberate choices on that. So. Um, I have uh, two separate series that are working specifically with basket patterns. Um, one that's working with basket patterns in negative space um, using uh, black gesso on white canvas um, and using the black area to sort of hold basic patterns of, of that exist in baskets uh, from my community. Um, but like giving the colors a bit of a pop um, creating symmetry, even though it's not symmetrical, like the spaces it's inside of is not symmetrical, but I've created symmetry through the layout of the patterns. Um, all of which sort of point to, uh, some murals that I worked on last summer where I used these same patterns, um, and created sort of a neon effect, uh, with those patterns as standalones, uh, which is interesting because there's, um, the patterns by themselves might not be terribly sexy. Um, they, you know, on baskets, they are like one tone, uh, really sort of um, square because it's almost working on like a, a grid, like pixels. Um, and so when you put them together and you add some colors and you give it a sense of, you know, modernity, like a, like, like a neon sort of value, um, it changes it, even though it's the same, it changes what you're looking at and how you're looking at it. Um, and likewise with the, this other basket pattern series that um, I'm creating spaces that almost look like textiles, like straight up almost look like textiles, but I'm using thick acrylic paint with thick paint application. Um, and, and I do, I mean, I am thinking a bit about Wayne Tybo's work and, and sort of the cakes and his thick, thick paint application. I'm pretty sure he used oils for the stuff he was doing. Uh, and thinking about how that related back to going to college and having a professor pointing out his work and then seeing it in person at the National Gallery um, of Art in Washington, D.C. And uh, playing on that too and, and pushing like, you know, it's like frosting on a cake, but 
these uh, these patterns still stand out stark, but they they do almost look like textiles in the way that they're done. But they're they're you know hard acrylic and and have peaks and movement, and so there's a lot of different things happening within those as well. Um, the subtlety of uh, the subtlety of abstract work in creating time and space and movement uh, on a two-dimensional surface is really exciting to me and something that I I've, don't think I've dared to explore up until this point. Yeah, so I did um, a pairing. They're two separate pieces, but they're uh, a pairing of pieces um, titled uh, Evil is Present. Um, and in it have used essentially typography to denote things that exist. I mean, there are words that exist everywhere, but these are words that really do exist among native people um, when describing certain things. So one is uh, negative words, um, things like uh, racial slurs uh, and, and disparaging words about native people, stupid Indian, you know, ugly, like all those things. Um, many of which are words that I just pulled from my childhood. Uh, and then the other one is more positive things. So it's like resilience and uh, medicine and community. Um, but they both have center mass, these uh, corpse tags. Um, I didn't know anything about this and I'm, I'm pretty well versed in history and, and, and familiar with bounties that were placed on the heads of indigenous people during westward expansion. Um, and the tools that were used in that time and place from uh, all uh, outright warfare all the way to you know boarding schools and how those things were weaponized uh, to eliminate people and culture and language and everything else. But I found out um, from a friend who just posted it that there's these uh, what they call corpse tags in Wyoming uh, or Wyoming territory. And the corpse tags, um, are these little brass, you know, two and a half inch pieces that have engraved on it. Um, it says corpse tags, has a space for a number. Um, it has the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is part of the Department of the Interior. Um, and then on the, the bottom part or the, the tail end part of the tag, um, it has a pressing in there that's a United States government property. Um, so these were used for, uh, for eliminating indigenous people and being able to collect bounties. And then those were official tags that existed. And so when I found out about it, I just was kind of blown away. I'd never heard of it because so, there's, a, there's a permanence to it. It's brass and it's engraved. Um, and I did a search and I found a couple for sale and I grabbed them and... I grabbed them because like even when we change, you know, like for example, change the Washington football team's name, there's still a presence that exists that's part of the, uh, it's part of the landscape of westward expansion. Um, and most people look at westward expansion as this, you know, really incredible and positive thing, progress, you know. Um, but the effect of those things on native communities was uh, devastating. And to find something from the 1800s that's still intact, that's real, that's an artifact. It's, a, it's an artifact that's like, you know, 150 years old. Um, and to be able to hold it in my hands and just how chilling that is. And so I wanted to place them in a space that denotes the bad things and the good things and the fact that this history is present no matter what happens and we should not ever resolve ourselves to forget that. Well, when I went to school, so I was a graphic design major in school and um, the graphic design uh, like master or uh, thesis or, or final was that you had to make a book. I was like, that's kind of lame. And so I went to the department head because I had been taking all these painting and drawing classes too, which were part of the major, but I was like really getting into it. But I took the same amount of graphic design courses so that I could have like a practical skill beyond painting. Um, and so I went to the department head and I was like, uh, hey, you know, like I know that this is the final for graphic design. Can I do, because the painting uh, majors get to do a show. So I was like, can I do a show and then I'll build all the collateral print materials that go with it to, to uh, appease my, my graphic design major. And she's like, 
no, it sounds like you want to be a painting major and then change my major without talking to me. So like I just woke up one day and I'm a painting major. Um, she kicked me out of the program. So I had all the classes, but then I'm now a painting major. And then I sort of justified, I was like, okay, well, I mean, I guess if I, I, you know, if I go to graduate school, then I have that and that, that'll make it easier for me to transition into like painting for, you know, graduate work. Um, and so, yeah, I just had that, but um, was really immersed in the painting. So um, I took one uh, performance art class in college and it was stupid. I hated it so much, uh, but to, put, to the professor's uh, credit, he introduced me to Guillermo Gomez Pena's work and, uh, and James Luna's work because they had done a collaboration. And so that's how I found James Luna's work. Um, and a year later, uh, I found myself with James at the Venice Biennale uh, through the National Museum of American Indians, um, which was the inaugural year that it opened. It was in, well, it was the, the next year, so it was in 2005. And um, I, was, I was never interested in James's performative work, but I was interested in how unapologetically indigenous he was, which to me was a really unique thing to find. And, um, but then I got suckered into his work and, you know, I just, it, it opened my eyes to it. And James famously said um, that performance art is one of the most important mediums for indigenous people because it gives us power in real time over the narratives that we share. Because in performance art, I can turn on a dime and change what you're looking at or what you're hearing. And uh, we don't have that much control over our own image. And, you know, you put a painting on the wall and people are going to bring their, their prejudices and their understandings and their misunderstandings and no one's going to inform it. They might be informed by the painting, but oftentimes not. With performance art, you can be confrontational, you can be subtle, you can tell stories, you can, be, you can have a presence in the space, which changes people's, it changes people's minds, but I think it changes people's spirit. And so uh, creating work that... I don't, for me, it was the one medium that I had that it allowed me to create art for the sake of creating art. Because when I start out, like you're not getting paid to do performance art, you're just doing it. And maybe it's tied into an exhibition, maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's this, this thing I feel compelled to do. Like my very first performance piece, it's just something I felt compelled to do. And, uh, but it became this medium that was very free to me because I could be as confrontational and as offensive and as anarchist as I wanted to be within the work, which I think lent itself to the power of the work because I wasn't beholden to worrying about, okay, how am I going to monetize this like you are with a painting? And, uh, and so I was free and performance work became incredibly important to me for that. And it is performance art is how I landed on the map, so to speak, um, gained enough recognition to be able to do what I'm doing now. There's this weird thing or like, um, like being in a position of challenging like stereotype and perception and all this stuff where um, people are like, hey, I have this really crappy thing. Do you want it? And I'm just in the habit of saying, yes, like I'll take it. So I have this collection of crap that um, I've acquired over the years. Uh, I, I bought a couple things at a trading post gift store down in the Springs uh, last, this week, earlier this week. Um, that's the first stuff I've ever purchased. And so it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, books and, uh, or things I've acquired, like I have Smurfs with headdresses on and it's just really strange things. But I, it, to me, it's totally Americana. It's totally the embodiment of like American perception. Um, it's strange, but it's, it's present. It's so present that nobody ever really realizes that it's there because it's, and I think that the existence of those things speaks to the invisibility of indigenous people in American culture. And um, which is of course, what the reason why there's inequities, why there's like, you know, racial slurs being used as team names, why like people are like, well, what's the big deal? Because it's so ingrained within the American identity that this is what these things are, um, that it leaves no room for actual uh, native informing 
of, of, of our own existence. And so putting something together that just is taking up space, like to me, it's absurd. Um, it's funny, it's upsetting, it's distur- it's all the things, <laughs> you know? And, and um, I had this idea of doing uh, essentially like a conceptual piece of just not even placing anything in positions, you know, like in a curatorial way where I'm making decisions. Like I just want to fill it with stuff and um, everything from fake headdresses to Smurfs to, you know, a Lone Ranger doll to storybooks of little kids pretending to be Indian. And it's just really strange. (laughs) I've been thinking a lot about uh, boarding schools in particular last summer um, as Canada, you know, has been finding these mass graves next to boarding schools, unmarked mass graves, next to boarding schools. Um, It's happening here in the United States too, but it's oddly very quiet. Um, They found an unmarked mass grave uh, next to the Stewart Indian School, which is the the school that my grandparents went to, my great grandparents went to. And um, so, you know, there's like a chance that my relatives knew the people that are in there. 200 bodies and so I've been thinking about like what would be a meaningful way to create something that acknowledges that pain I didn't go to boarding school um, but I am probably where the half of our generation didn't go to boarding schools and the other half did Um, and then the next generation like my kids Um, none of them, they're the first generation to not go to boarding school. And, um, so it's one of these things that has affected everybody and it affects everybody in a lot of different ways. And it's something that I think is incredibly important. So in, in, in thinking about that and thinking about how awkward Western culture is, you know, even something as simple as like a chair and that chairs are this seemingly innocuous thing like we sit on them and we sit at desks and we sit in a classroom or we you know we sit we sit in our cars we sit on the bus you know and so we don't think about chairs and um, in boarding schools I feel like chairs were weaponized uh, and weaponized in a way that for native people was just was really devastating So when you bring a child in and you're preparing them for boarding school, you set them in a chair to cut their hair off. You set them in a chair when they're being punished to hit them or to strike them or to poke needles in their tongue because they're speaking their language uh, or, or, you know, forcing them to sit in a chair to eat uh, or forcing them to sit in a chair to learn and that there is like, there's no freedom in those spaces and the chair is weaponized as this thing, like that's where you have to stay. And it's like a, it's like a cage with no walls, but you, you're expected to stay in that chair. And how jarring that must've been for a child that, you know, who's growing up with their parents and, you know, free, they're playing and, you know, doing the things that kids do and then finding yourself in this space where the chair ends up representing, you know, everything that you're supposed to be doing or however you're supposed to be doing it. And so um, I've weaponized chairs by sharpening its feet and, uh, and doing it sort of in a way that looks hacked and haphazard um, because of the, I think the, the, just the gritty nature of those things. Like it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, it just needs to be sharp and, uh, and it's sharp, um, so that it does its job and, um, and then stacking them, uh, in a way that looks like a pile of chairs, um, not stacking them in a way that's meant to be symmetrical or, or anything like that, but just like a pile of chairs with sharpened legs <laughs> and, um, in the center area, uh, there's um, one chair that's sitting normal, and on that chair, on the seat of that chair, are uh, my braids and um, and then my oldest son's braid um, because we both cut our hair last year, and um, that's sort of the beginning. The hair removal is the beginning of the boarding school experience. 
Um, well, that's not true. Removal from family is the beginning of the boarding school experience. But when you enter into those walls, the first thing they do is they bathe you and they cut your hair. And um, so that seems important. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to create work with that that is, um, that is a little more conceptual and a little more um, abstract. I'm, I don't want to do things too on the nose. I'd like to have something that people can feel the threat of the points of the chairs pointing out um, and think about these chairs. Um, and, and this equates to other work that, that is coming up that is related to this and focusing on the weaponizing of chairs within the boarding school experience. In the same way that, you know, we're intersecting, you know, like subculture of like punk rock with indigenous identity. Like, I think that we can, it's so often it's like, well, you can only be this one thing, you know, like you can only dance powwow and that's it. Like we're starting to see indigenous like uh, athletes that are unapologetically, unapologetically indigenous, but also athletes. And, um, and so, that's another thing, like why can't we intersect art and bikes and, you know, cultural identity and like, th that's really what it's about. It's just taking all these things and as I'm doing that in my work, like I'm doing it outside of my work as well to uh, make it more inclusive that we don't have to be one thing or another. The bike industry is like at one point was very much um, like if you're going to be a cyclist, like you have to go all in and abandon all other identities so that you can like be all about the tour de France or whatever. And, um, that's not the case. There's a lot of people that ride bikes that have nothing to do with pro racing or amateur racing or anything. They just want to ride bikes and have fun. What does that look like? And what does that look like in terms of recognizing that you're riding on the homelands of someone who's still here and recognizing that aspect of it as well. So I think that, you know, you can't do something in the outdoor industry and just ignore the fact that you're on the homelands of somebody who's been displaced. And uh, that's another aspect of it as well. So I think it's just about, like you see here, the intersection of just multiple subcultures that like all converge into one you know, set of complicated, you know, identities that, you know, you gravitate to. So like I can do punk rock and I can do tattoos and I can be indigenous and I can really like movies and I can really like riding bikes and I can also acknowledge where I am. I can do all those things. Everybody can do all those things. And that's, what's really cool about it.